In July this year, in a small West Sussex village, people woke up one morning to an unfamiliar sight, their new neighbours, a group of Buddhist monks, on their arms round. Their order has existed in the East for two and a half thousand years, and they've come to England now in response to a growing interest here in Buddhism. They aim to live the simple and disciplined life which the Buddha laid down for the earliest forest monks. There are many Buddhist groups in Britain, but this is the first attempt at such a traditional approach. They have to follow 227 rules which govern every aspect of their life. The rules provide them with a framework for developing spiritual insight and what the Buddhist scriptures call loving kindness towards all creation. The community consists of about 20 monks, novices and lay followers. Their day has begun at 4 a.m. with meditation followed by chanting in Pali. But very little of their day is taken up with ceremonies. They've just moved into a derelict Victorian house with a hundred acre forest nearby. Their first task was to clear up all the debris and make it habitable. Monks are trained to be content with little. They eat only one meal a day. They don't listen to music, watch television or read novels. They have to remain celibate and they are permitted few possessions. <laughs> their aim is to be free of everything which might distract them from their main task, putting into practice the Buddha's teaching about the path to enlightenment. The spiritual head of the order is the Venerable Ajahn Chah. He has come from Thailand for a few weeks to lend his support to the new sanctuary. Many people in the West today seem to have much dissatisfaction and unhappiness in their hearts, and they feel they don't have a satisfactory means of dealing with it. The teachings of the Buddha offer the practice of meditation, which is a way of solving problems and overcoming confusion. We've been invited over here because many people want to learn how to put the teaching into practice with the aim of finding a path through their confusion towards peace and calm. But how is all this going to go down in West Sussex? For hundreds of years, Western Christians have exported their religion. Now, for the first time, the West is on the receiving end. This little hamlet is essentially... It's been steeped in religion for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, Christian religion. We have this little shepherd's church, we always sort of call it, I suppose it was a shepherd's church, which is in the Doomsday Book. Then you have the old manor, which was originally an abbey. Even the ground... I would say, was steeped in Christianity. There were just a few people, but they all mind. They do mind terribly. Not the ones anti-anything at all, but this is absolutely alien to, to, the, to the locality. It's an intrusion. It's an invasion. They're all coming from outside. One doesn't know whether they're English, where they come from, anything about them. And they're all searching for something. We've got what we want. I mean, we've only got to look out of this wonderful world and here we've got a god always have had a god well we're not at all anti the monks i mean um in this godless world anything that has some sort of spiritual content which we think they have 
is better than nothing. I mean, what is there against them, actually? Well, I think their discipline is very high, uh, as far as I understand. I, I mean, the people I've met are absolutely delightful. I had a fit nearly when I see them come down in the woods. Uh, I looked up as I was working, you know, and I, good Lord, what's this coming? But I didn't know they were rain, so, but, uh, got talking to them and found them very friendly. Well, I, I think it's all right, friends, that they keep themselves, they won't do us any harm, I suppose. I don't know what they're doing now, are they, um, searching for food? Yes, I yes. disapprove of that, frightfully. I reckon these people can get their own. That's what I feel. <laughs> I've been about too long, I think. The hardest point for the monks to get across was why they went on their traditional arms round. Were they just scroungers, or was this a vital part of Buddhist practice? To try to explain this and many other points, soon after they arrived, they held a meeting in the village hall. A film was shown on their parent monastery in Thailand, where most of them were trained. These monks in northeast Thailand are on Bindabhat, the daily dawn walk to receive their food offered by the villagers. They're not allowed to possess money, nor grow their own food. This ensures their total dependence on the lay community, so they can't cut themselves off in a spiritual cocoon. For the laity, Bindabhat is a way of paying respect to the discipline of the monks, and also a way of making merit, which many believe brings good fortune in this life and in future rebirths. Rumours in the Sussex village had been rife. If they weren't the Moonies, then they were communist spies, or the abbot was the king of Thailand in disguise. There were many questions to be answered. The meeting was chaired by the local vicar. Would anybody like to start the ball rolling? I think this is the most remarkable uh, event which this hall has ever seen. And uh, I'm quite prepared to believe that I shall wake up tomorrow and it was all a dream. And my question is, what is the size of the community? How many hangers-on are there? And is it going to grow, or is it going to remain much as it is? Uh, the number of cars that are arriving at the weekends. This is what we are worried about. Are we to respect more of them in the future? The only reason people are asking you questions is because you're different. You know, you come here dressed all in your funny gear. All I've got to say is good luck to you. If you can make a go of it and get something for nothing, great. Right. <laughs> I quite honestly mean it, you know. Good luck. Thank you, George. <laughs> Walking through Leicester Square fortnight ago, I came across what appeared to me to be a sort of Buddhist raver. Um, I don't know who the people concerned were, but they were certainly in saffron. Uh, <coughs> habits rather like your own. They had shaven heads. They were banging cymbals um, and had really gone completely ecstatic. Um, I think one of the things that we have a fear of here is that these sort of people who may be a fringe element, I don't know of your um, faith, um, may come down here and this sort of thing may go on the chitters. <laughs> The monk's way of meeting doubts that they were just another weird and possibly dangerous sect was to invite the local people to the sanctuary to take a look for themselves. They explained that their rules forbade them to ask for food, and they didn't expect to be fed by their neighbours, but they were keeping up the tradition of the arms round partly as a way of making contact. Their one meal a day has to be eaten before noon. Part of their food will be grown by their lay helpers, and the rest will be donated by Buddhist supporters from further afield. Today it's been given by the Hampshire Buddhist Society. This temporary dining room was provided by their chairman, who owns a marquee company. 
You don't have to be a monk to be a devout Buddhist. You can lead an active business life, provided it's not an immoral one. We come today to offer a, a meal to the monks, which is known as dharma, and this is an act of giving which establishes a sort of a relationship between lay people and the monks. And it's not, as is often thought, a, a case of just giving something to gain merit, but ideally, or in the perfect way, giving dharma is a case of giving a little bit of oneself, and so it's in keeping with all the basic Buddhist teachings of the prophet ones. I've been asked why I'm Buddhist. It's not very easy to answer that, because it's a slow process, and I think a gradual confidence grows, but I suppose it comes down really to the fact that I see, well, it's called dukkha in Pali, which is the old Buddhist language. Uh, probably I understand it as dis-ease, um, imperfection or suffering, and I see this in others, but more importantly in myself. Uh, and I'm of confidence that the Buddhist way of practice uh, is a way of doing away with it gradually. But probably more important than a sort of an intellectual uh, motivation is the fact that I meet monks. And I think in all cases, the ones that I've met have been wonderful examples of the result of the training, the sort of fruition of it, if you like. Today, all of you Buddhists have had a chance to come. One of the monk's main roles is to teach. The idea is that the lay people provide food for the body and the monks provide food for the mind. The sanctuary is a kind of spiritual powerhouse where people come to be recharged. So as we see all other people, we see uh, other uh, people's children, that we learn to love other people's children in the same way that we would love our own children. Ajahn Papakaro used to give pep talks of a different kind when he was a U.S. Army captain in Vietnam where he first encountered Buddhism. I began to practice uh, as a layperson in the army, and uh, it became quite obvious that uh, if I wanted to continue uh, being a devout lay Buddhist, to practice strictly adhere to the training precepts that are taught and things, that just to wear a military uniform would be against those teachings. I thought if I wanted to do it uh, 100%, that it would be best to become a monk. And uh, here I am, eight years later. <laughs> Tanaranyabo has been a policeman, a merchant seaman, a TV engineer and a barman, but for the last three years a Buddhist monk. The Buddha's teaching was always intended to be flexible, and there's nothing in it which prohibits adapting to new ways, provided they don't contradict the basic principles. I'm not a very high-minded person. In fact, high-mindedness sometimes I find more aggravating than a, just a basic down-to-earth approach to life. Honesty is all it's about. Trying to be totally honest about things as they are and about you as you are. Because man needs to know, apart from his job and everything, which is part of his life, men need to know who they are. Who you are and what you are, not what you're doing, what you are, is very important. And monks are concerned more with that. Because, I mean, I myself have done many things, different kinds of jobs. But uh, I didn't know who I was. If a man gets too separated from the world or his environment, he gets ill. I think I've seen that in myself and in other people, a certain kind of alienation, loss of harmony. To have harmony, you need to know yourself. And uh, harmony is the greatest peace and happiness. If you don't have harmony, it doesn't matter what you've got. Meditation is seen as the path towards harmony. The Buddha taught that the main reason we become unhappy in life is that we fail to recognize that nothing can last forever. So we cling to possessions, our youth, happy feelings, our loved ones, in the vain hope that things will never change. And when they do, we feel thwarted and miserable. The aim of Buddhist practice, meditation combined with moral living, is a very down-to-earth one to find a way of overcoming unhappiness. The Buddha taught 
that this can only be achieved when we reach a sense of detachment, a perspective from where we're no longer upset by the ups and downs of life. When we accept that all existence is impermanent, we begin to take things in our stride. And once we stop clinging to things as though they last forever, then we begin to overcome unhappiness. So meditation is taught as a way of reaching serenity, and it's one which anybody can systematically follow. The Buddha wasn't a god, but a man, who two and a half thousand years ago found a way of reaching the ultimate serenity, nirvana. But meditation isn't regarded as something just for monks. Does your meditation include the mindfulness aspect which was taught by the Buddha? One of the first visitors to the center was Rear Admiral Shattuck. He developed his meditation technique when he was Admiral commanding the Malayan area. I think what is significant about meditation at the present moment is the way in which it's spreading. It is a form of scientific prayer which people can learn um, by stages and uh, not only learn, but be convinced by stages that they are doing something which is benefiting themselves, not because they become richer or do their job better, but simply because they feel much more complete in themselves as a more complete person. The object of the exercise is simply to find the inner resources of your being and make more use of them in your daily life. Uh, when one has the greater sensitivity that the development of the mind gives you, you are better able to know how to help your fellow men and what they need and what you yourself can give them which will help them on their way. I think this is the, the object. It's a selfless object. It's not a selfish object, although selfish satisfactions may come from it incidentally. Meditation is often thought of as a self-centered pastime associated with hippies and dropouts rather than admirals. But many of the people here have come not to escape the world, but to find out how to be more effective in it. I'm an occupational therapist. I was working in a psychiatric unit with people who had different kinds of emotional disturbance, and I enjoyed the work, but I felt that there was probably a better way to help people, and that really I needed to learn a bit more about life and about myself, so that I could begin to have some understanding of the sort of things that were happening to these people. A lot of people say that the monks are very selfish, that they spend all their time working on themselves, and that this way of life doesn't really benefit anybody else very much. But it's benefited me enormously, because what they're doing is living a teaching, and they're making it work and showing other people that they can make it work too. That's one of the things that they do to help. They just act as, as a kind of a living embodiment of the teaching. Well, if it, if it hadn't been for this practice and this teaching, I would have ended up in a nut house. You do some meditation and you conduct yourself very mindfully and peacefully. You get insights into the way your own mind's going around in its own particular short circuits. And you break through a lot of neurotic behavior patterns and you find yourself coping with the world again, simply because this training's shown you how to look into your own mind. Even the most menial work can be regarded as a form of meditation if it's carried out with awareness. The aim of the training is to make them constantly aware of the present moment. Since monks are forbidden to till the soil, this is done by a novice or layman. One of the community is a former property millionaire who now seeks a different kind of satisfaction. No, no, not digging. Just the just wheat, the, just I show you. You see? Okay. In charge of the gardens is Walter Stangl. As a German soldier in the last war, he was imprisoned by the Russians in Siberia. 
For some years, he was a Buddhist monk himself, but most recently he's worked as a head gardener at Kew. Now he's decided to devote the rest of his life to this community. You see, you take it off, put it here in. Yeah. Through Buddhism, I found out more or less or a little bit who I am, and I'm still discovering how little I am. Buddha said, don't believe in me, what I say. Just find out for yourself. Not believing on thinking it's this is or that this way. Stand on your own feet. Be your own explorer, your own discoverer, and see what is on. What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose to be here? Is it just the purpose here to accumulate money, property, houses and cars and all the rest of it? I don't think so. There must be something else. And I feel Buddhism is coming more and more to Europe. We are tired in this saying, Believe in me and follow me. Now, this Buddhism is coming to get to waken up people, to find out for themselves what is it. The Buddha taught that understanding is more important than believing, and that enlightenment doesn't come in the form of grace from a divine power, but as a result of man's own efforts to understand the teaching. Here the monks are performing a ceremony for a couple who've recently been married. The groom was once a monk himself. There's no dishonor in having disrobed, since Buddhists accept that all states are subject to change. Buddhist ceremonies aren't considered as sacred, merely as a means of focusing the mind, and they don't always have to be conducted with solemnity. At the end of the ceremony, they tie a thread as a gesture of good luck. Even the cat benefits from the ritual sprinkling. <laughs> We'll probably get letters from me. Who'd <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> be a Buddhist cat? <laughs> Soon after their arrival, the monks were visited by three senior members of the Anglican clergy. The local rural dean is Canon Heyman. Could we ask why you come from another culture wearing the particular robes that you do wear? Uh, into our into our society, which has a, a, a long, rich tradition of spirituality and meditation. When I was uh, asked to come to England, people would say, uh, "Are you going to wear those robes? Uh, they'll only repel people. Uh, people will think you are some kind of uh, hippie or freak, and that uh, it will not help Buddhism at all. You should dress." for the particular cultural setting you're going to. And then we reflected on this for a while, and we thought that yet this is only a matter of opinion, it has to be tried first. Because uh, symbolically, <clears throat> these robes are, have, a, have a, a, a tremendous amount of value. And the color, the, the shaven head, and all these are symbolic of those who leave uh, the home life, or the homeless life, like uh, shaving the head. Uh, is a way of saying I'm giving up the worldly life because hair is a, can be a great sign of vanity and, and uh, uh, attraction. But uh, we're not here to criticize or to fault find with the society, but to show by our own example a way that is possible uh, to live in this society without uh, without being caught in the foolishness of it. But not all local Christians were so willing to listen. Pastor Carter is a minister from the Evangelical Church. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the door. 
And what's happening? All these false religions are coming in uh, from the East. False cults are coming in from America. We're dabbling in the occult, and this is not the answer. The answer is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so come back to your question. I'm sorry, and I'm grieved that England is now turning to all these false religions which are not really the answer. Buddha is dead, but Jesus Christ is alive. It is a great responsibility, but it is a joyful responsibility to go and tell all mankind about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hello. Hello. My name is uh, Pastor Carter from the Hazemere Evangelical Church. How do you do? Now I come to you from all the uh, Bible-believing Christians in this area, and I've come to tell you the, the great message that Jesus Christ loves you, and he died for you to save you from your sin, and he's living today. I was only speaking to him this morning. He's a living <laughs> Lord. He's a living Lord. And I've come to... Pre the monks willingly accepted the gift of a Bible, but they made no attempt to convert the pastor in their turn. Buddhism today doesn't try to make converts. But the monks were happy to explain their views to anyone who was interested. They were invited to the home of Brigadier and Mrs. Chatterton. I think it's very interesting that young people are turning to, if I may say, so Buddhism or that form of spiritual situation because the Christian church uh, hasn't got the hope that it had. I mean, it's only 11% of 52 million people. It doesn't grip, does it? doesn't seem to. No, no, that's the point. We see religions, uh, any religion, as a convention or a tool or some kind of vehicle which uh, we use in order to transcend the worldly uh, suffering, the, the cycle of birth and death, in order to be one with the ultimate truth. Mm. And I think in Christianity, maybe the conventions they use, uh, the words are different uh, the way they talk, but it all is pointing in the same direction at that which is, uh, say, beyond description, that which we call immortal, or beyond birth and death, that which is perfect and complete. Yes. We're not claiming that ours is the only true path, but it is one of the conventions that we, uh, through our own personal practice and experience, have found very useful and beneficial. The main problem when one religion tries to understand another is the lack of a common vocabulary. This is what the local clergymen hoped to find. They showed the monks around a former Christian priory, which seemed a suitable setting for a metaphysical discussion. When you are meditating, uh, are you having any regard to what we would call God? I'd be very shy of using the word God. Mm. Uh, I would say that it's becoming aware of the way things are, the way your mind is, the way that your mind works, but the way that all things are interconnected, interrelated. It's opening yourself up to that which is beyond your immediate knowledge and realizing there is something beyond that that which arises and that which passes away, that yeah. which is mortal, that which is born and dies. But whatever that is, you can't understand it, and you can't name it. What, what I'm worried about is that we don't seem to have a word which we can both use to describe what we're seeking. If I'm seeking ultimate truth, and if the abbot and Buddhist monks are seeking the ultimate truth, and if we accept that the ultimate truth cannot alter or be anything different, then there must be some way in which we we can communicate with each other. The world will separate, right? He's a Buddhist, I'm a Christian. But intrinsically, basically, in what I'm doing, I feel that there is as much between you and me as there is between any other worshipping and sincere and devout Christian. So that I can see it. Local clergymen like the Reverend Christopher Boxley feel they personally can find a meeting point. But for the Church of England as a whole, does the presence of Buddhism in any way pose a threat? It can't be bad if it's something that challenges you. And the presence of Buddhists in rural West Sussex, which 
uh, is traditionally the sort of heart of the Church of England, the challenge in itself must be something which says, well, what is this tradition? If our tradition is worth anything, the tradition of Christianity, the tradition that many of us uh, have been prepared to die for and all sorts of things, really, what is it saying? The old um, argument of the Church of England being the Tory party at prayer. I mean, this is something which does put a lot of young people off. We need somehow to say that beyond the dreariness, beyond the formality, beyond everything that you associate with churches and boredom, there is a tradition of seeking the truth. The Buddhists have given us, or be, by being here, give us the opportunity to look at our own traditions and, I hope, to preserve what is worthwhile in those traditions, but to have the courage also to say about some of them that really they're not worth keeping. It's early days yet to see how Sussex will take to Buddhism. But it doesn't seem likely that familiar rituals will be abandoned in favour of Sunday afternoons in the lotus position. By comparison with the active pursuits of rural Sussex, Buddhist meditation might seem a rather passive and therefore unrewarding pastime. The monks don't condemn the active life, but their hope is to demonstrate to their neighbours that the most effective actions come from a still mind, and that the path to the still mind is meditation. The Buddha said, when a man attains wisdom through the teaching, he becomes serene and at peace, like a lake which is deep, clear and still. Many people uh, say Buddhism is very nihilistic, uh, which when you look at it in terms of you, your little self living in this vast universe, it is. It's a total annihilation in a sense. But it's an, it's an annihilation of that small-minded way of looking at the world, from, always from you, ego-centered thing. Uh, but that's not all there is. And when that dies, something very beautiful comes into being. And that's the side of people who don't understand when they, when they make that accusation. Um, and as I've seen with people who've meditated, the more they've stuck it and meditated and, and their self has been ground away, they just start to blossom. It's incredible. I mean, it's, if that's death, I mean, that's fine with me. All this can never be fully understood if all we do is talk about it. Just as we can never know whether an apple tastes sweet or sour, unless we actually taste it for ourselves. The ultimate truth is like the flavor of an apple, which you can't see with the eye or hear with the ear. The only way to experience it is to put the teaching into practice. Once you've tasted it, you'll no longer be in any doubt about its flavor, and you won't have to ask anyone else. The problem will be solved. We invite you to come and visit us. Come on. We invite you to come oh, and visit that's us. Oh, that's very kind of you. We'd love to. Yeah. So you can when see you're... what we're doing. When you're <laughs> what you're up to. Yeah. <laughs>